members, we have four bills today. Uh, just as a note, uh, right up front, the intention. All right, we are back all online with our mute buttons on, our cameras on, and uh, most of the computers up here are working. But uh, again, uh, the Senate Taxes Committee will come to order. Uh, we have uh, four bills, uh, members, those will be laid over. And also, before we get started, I just want to note that we have a few bills that we'll be uh, asking Senator Weber and his subcommittee to look at. These are property tax bills. And just uh, so uh, there's a transparency about where these bills are going, uh, Senate File 2976. Special tax rules provision and Senate File 3069, the Lax County Tax and Jurisdiction and Personal Revenue Law. Senator Weber, please ask me to uh, take a look, take a look at those. Uh, members, uh, and also before we have our first bill up, I wanted to take a note and a request as much as possible to our uh, tax committee members. Um, if we can get amendments early, uh, it lets us start on time. When we get uh, amendments in uh, after 4 p.m., the day before the meeting, it makes it very hard for those makes it very hard for those amendments to get processed and to the members. So if I could ask if at all possible if you can work uh, with your staff. Uh, if you have amendments, the earlier you get them to us, the better we'll be able to uh, process those and get those started. Um, our first bill today is uh, Senator Housley. Uh, welcome to the committee, Senator Housley. Senator Housley has Senate File 2865, which is federal conformity to the Shuttered Venues Operators Grant Program. And I'm wondering if someone on the committee would like to move that bill. Chamberlain. Senator Chamberlain, I move Senate File 2865. Uh, Senator Housley. Thank you. Welcome Madam. to the committee. Uh, and speaking of amendments, do you have an amendment? Madam Chair, I have an amendment. All right. Well, let's make sure all the members have that amendment. Um, I don't know that I have it yet either. So do you have a copy for yourself? I do. All right. If amendment. we can have the pages, uh, please distribute that amendment. And I think, uh, Senator Housley, are you going to want to um, describe your amendment and uh, added as an author's amendment, um, or do you want to, um, just, or is it a delete all amendment? It is not a delete all amendment. It, uh, it's an amendment that we got last night from Senate Council just to clean the bill up to get it in the shape that it needs to be, and it's just a technical bill, or technical amendment. Uh, thank you, Senator Housley. I understand that uh, it's a technical amendment as well. With that, um, Senator Chamberlain, would you like to move the A1 amendment? I will move the A1 amendment. Uh, thank you, Senator Chamberlain. And uh, Ms. Pollack, if you could pop on just briefly, especially uh, as members haven't really had a chance to see this, but if you could just briefly describe this technical amendment, please. Sure, uh, Madam Chair and Ms. members. Pollack. Madam Chair and members, um, the amendment uh, just clarifies that the uh, federal conformity is also to the appropriation that was given to the Shuttered Venue Operators Grants Program in the American Rescue Plan. Um, the, the program was initially uh, enacted in the Consolidated Appropriations Act in late 2020, which is referenced in the bill uh, as introduced, but the amendment just ensures that the, um, that the conformity also applies to the uh, ARPA uh, appropriation as well. And M Madam Chair, my understanding is that the uh, revenue estimate does reflect the bill uh, as it will be amended. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Ms. Pollack. All right, so we have the uh, A1 amendment, uh, and you'd like to incorporate that as an author's amendment, which, which we yes, will do. Yes, Madam Chair. All right, uh, Senator Housley, to your bill as amended. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. As we all oh, know... Um, um, excuse me, Senator Housley. <coughs> Senator Bach. Oh, we, uh, we moved it, and it's an author's amendment that we will incorporate as to get the bill in the shape the author um, prefers. We, we can definitely adopt it. Uh, let's adopt the A1 amendment, technical amendment, get the bill in the shape of the author would prefer. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The amendment is adopted, and your bill is in the shape uh, as the fiscal note as well. So, Senator Housley, to your bill. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Like you said, this Senate File 2865 is a bill to conform to the federal tax treatment of shuttered venues. Um, we all know during COVID, uh, everything shut down, including, including um, all of our, our event venues for concerts, theaters, live performing arts, museums, zoos, aquariums, uh, motion, motion pictures. And we'll hear from some of um, those owner operators in the testimony today. But the this bill will conform to uh, the federal tax treatment that they got in the COVID-related Tax Relief Act in 2020. So these grants um, will not, they will be able to um, deduct the expenses paid with the grant funds. They'll be excluded from their income um, for corporate and franchise tax. So that's what it does, it's simple. Um, and I, th I have Melissa Reed who can explain a little bit more and then we'll toss it to our testifiers. Ms. Reed, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record, and then Thank you may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senators. Melissa Reed um, with Park Street Public here today on behalf of the Minnesota Independent Venue Alliance. And thank you, Senator Housley, so much for laying this out and for your continued support of, um, of our venues and our owner operators. Um, I'm gonna save most of our time for, um, our, for our owner. Senators, thank you. New to the Zoom world here. Um, nice to be back in room 15, though, I have to say. Um, but um, our owners, operators, the musicians who utilize our spaces and rely on them for their sources of income, festivals, promoters, um, our members were the first to close and were the last to open uh, throughout the pandemic and have received no real targeted support um, other than some support from the federal government. And so we're here today to ask for your support um, for federal conformity for the tax burden um, that our venues and operators are facing. Minnesota is currently the only state that we are aware of that has not conformed to the federal tax treatment of the small uh, shuttered venue operator grants. So we are really um, hopeful that the Senate will take early action both on this bill and on uh, tax conformity in general. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Madam Chair actually with with your, with your permission, I went, uh, we have a couple of testifiers who are here. Um, Jack and Lowell are here um, electronically. So thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, thank you, Ms. Reed. Uh, Mr. Jack Cole Williams, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record, please. Good morning, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Jack Cole Williams, and I'm executive director and co-founder of a nonprofit organization called Twin Cities Catalyst Music. And today I'm here representing uh, the Minnesota Independent Venue Alliance as the vice chair for our organization. Uh, so yeah, thank you for having us. <laughs> thank you for having me here today. I also wanna thank Senator Housley for continuing to champion independent music venues, promoters, festivals, and small business owners throughout the state of Minnesota since the beginning of the pandemic. For a little bit of background, the Minnesota Independent Venue Alliance is a 501c6 nonprofit organization with the mission to preserve, nurture, the ecosystem of independent venues and promoters throughout the state. We represent both for-profit and non-profit organizations. Today I'm here to speak on behalf of SF2865, which would bring Minnesota into federal tax conformity regarding treatment of the shuttered venue operators grants awarded by Congress. 253 small businesses and nonprofit organizations in Minnesota received grants, which helped to save our internationally recognized independent music industry during the pandemic. These grants were the only targeted relief we received throughout the pandemic and many of Minnesota's local independent venues would have closed without. If the legislature and the governor do not pass this tax conformity, the estimated impact is 10% of our overall grants award, which we did not account for in our grant budgets that have already been approved by the SBA. Tax conformity is impacting both of our for-profit and non-profit members, which I can personally attest to as it came to quite a shock to me and my organization when we received a 1099 from the state to collect upon our shuttered operators grant. With concerts and events continuing to postpone and reschedule, events are facing distressed attendance and increased expenses. Now is not the time for the state of Minnesota to tax SBOG grants. Madam Chair and members, I ask for your support in Minnesota's conformity to the federal tax code regarding the shuttered venue operators grants and your support of SF2865. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cole Williams. S Senator Housley, do you also have another testifier, Lowell Pickett? Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Pickett, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record, please. Uh, Madam Chair and members, my name is Lowell Pickett. I'm the founder and co-owner of the Dakota and downtown Minneapolis 
the Dakota is a member of the Minnesota Independent Venue Alliance and the state of which is the state affiliate of the National Independent Venue Alliance. Um, thank you, Senator Housley, for carrying this important legislation forward. Uh, the Dakota is a uh, music and restaurant, music venue and restaurant in downtown Minneapolis. We've been in business for 35 years. Uh, we employ 70 people. We hire over 1,500 musicians a year. In addition to the direct economic impact that we have within our four walls, we have significant watershed in economic impact uh, on the city in general. And we're uh, an important resource for the state. Our customers uh, drive in for shows from uh, actually all over the region. Uh, we also buy a thousand hotel rooms a year uh, for our touring artists. Uh, when we closed in the fall, I mean, in uh, March of 2020, no one envisioned that it would last for a year and a half. We initially laid our staff off for two weeks and paid them for two weeks in the understanding that we we're going to reopen in two weeks. Um, by a year and a half later, uh, you know, that things had changed dramatically. Um, we were convinced in September of 2020 that we were not going to be able to reopen. My business partner uh, said, let's start winding it down now. And um, we uh, put plans in place to be closed by the end of the year. Uh, we, and that would have been permanent. Um, we decided to try to stay open because of the pending legislation for uh, shuttered venue operators that had been uh, proposed in, in August of 2020. Uh, the only reason we were able to do that is because our landlord agreed to uh, abate our rent during this period of time. If they hadn't done that, we would have closed. Uh, when in, uh, the bill was passed and signed into law in December of 2020, that changed everything. Gave us a tremendous amount of hope that we could actually reopen and stay in business. Um, we submitted our grant proposal, uh, which took a considerable amount of time. The delay in the grant going through was significant. But in the summer of 2021, these grants were finally awarded and distributed. Um, and that made the difference for us. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. Um, those grant applications were very specific. We submitted budgets. Uh, there was no consideration for, uh, uh, for a tax uh, liability on the state level in the budgets for the grant. And we have to conform to the budgets of the grant for those monies. Um, other things that weren't, you know, there's still no guarantees. The grant provided, uh, allowed us to reopen. Um, without the grant, we wouldn't have opened. Uh, but what's taken place since last uh, fall, uh, when, when these funds came through, uh, is quite different than we'd anticipated. Uh, we reopened in September. Uh, we've been sort of a wounded animal in that whole process in the whole the time period since we reopened. We have not been able to uh, operate at full capacity. Uh, we're a business that's designed to be uh, to operate seven days a week. Uh, we have a full kitchen staff. We have food that comes in. We, uh, you know, it has to be planned for, and and it's been really uh, uh, kind of fits and starts since September. There are a number of nights when we haven't been able to be real, uh, been open at all. Um, either a musician has canceled uh, their tour uh, because of COVID or, uh, and we haven't been able to refill the night. And that's con that took place throughout the fall. December, we were looking pretty, we were feeling pretty optimistic. Things were really picking up. And then Omicron hit in January. And we were open, uh, we were closed half a dozen nights in January. It's continued. Last Saturday, we had a, uh, a very well sold show. Uh, Saturday morning, we got a message saying that um, uh, that the artist uh, that was scheduled that night that people had purchased tickets for and that we knew was part of a Valentine's Day was sick. And we scrambled and we, uh, we were able to find somebody else to perform. We couldn't uh, tell guests that were coming in that we're now going to charge you for a show that you thought uh, you were going to see, but you're not. So we didn't charge anybody any money for tickets that night. Uh, we felt that it was too important to, uh, 
We knew that our staff was relying on the income from that night. We knew that people had made plans, probably Valentine's Day plans to come in for a special evening. Um, we knew that if we would close that night, we would have issues with uh, a lot of disappointed customers and we would have staff that we would have been out of work. If we had closed that night, we would have paid the staff. Uh, I should add that all of those nights that we closed between now and last September, we paid our staff. Um, and we paid the estimated tips that we thought that they, that they you know, we could calculate what the tips would be. We had to do this because those people that work for us are depending on that income to pay their rent, to pay their, their heating bill, to pay their living expenses. And if we can't guarantee them an income of a certain level if they're going to work for us, they're not going to be able to keep those jobs. Um, it's, uh, it's been a mess. Um, to have this other element thrown into it where we might be taxed on the funds that we're already exceeding, uh, uh, we're, we're already exceeding the expenses that we anticipated we'd be incurring right now because primarily because of Omicron and the slow ramp up again to full, full operation, to have another element thrown in there to be taxed on those funds would be devastating. It would be devastating on us. I think it would, um, I have no uh, doubt that it would be devastating on uh, businesses like us throughout the state. Um, and um, well, simply put, we don't have the money to pay this tax bill. Um, and uh, small businesses like us are really the we're, we're uh, as has already been mentioned, we were the first to close. We were the last to reopen. Uh, we're really kind of a bulwark against uh, a deepening recession as a result of the pandemic. Uh, the number of people that are employed in businesses like, businesses like ours is significant. Um, and we need the support of the state if we're going to be able to uh, continue to do what we're doing and to employ people and to provide a resource for uh, the citizens throughout the state. Um, and uh, taxing us, you know, as I understand it, being the only, it would be the only state in the country that would tax this particular uh, lifeline that was thrown to us through the uh, federal leg legislation uh, would really be devastating. Um, Thank you, so Mr. Pickett. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony. I, I know we're running late. I just want to give you uh, a, a minute to close up if you if there's something that you are no, not no, able I to just, share yet. No, no, no. It's I just um, be happy to answer any questions, and that we urgently ask you to uh, pass this legislation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pickett. Uh, and and we are well aware of the Dakota Jazz Club and Restaurant, uh, and and the challenges there. Um, I do have a question, and it could be to uh, Mr. Pickett or Miss Reed. Mr. Kolbs, uh, Senator Housley, I'm just not really sure where to field this question, so I am just going to ask it, and I'll look for whoever feels they might be able to respond. So clearly, uh, uh, the all of the uh, COVID-related uh, uh, shutdowns have been damaging uh, to our entire society in many ways. Uh, but what I would say is that um, in, in trying to uh, understand what's happening here with uh, the, and, and the arts we believe and the performing arts have been severely impacted, particularly because those are uh, only, you don't, you don't really do those uh, online. Uh, you can, but so those, those personal uh, facing public venues have been severely uh, damaged uh, th throughout the, through the, throughout the uh, pandemic. But I noticed a lot of, I have two questions. One is about um, how the shuttered venue grant is going to help. Who is it going to help? And I think Mr. Pickett described uh, clearly the staff issues with keeping a venue open when you don't have the ticket sales to support that. Certainly that's understandable. But there's one a voice that I just have not heard from that I think might be one of the most uh, at risk uh, from the pandemic uh, and the related shutdowns, and that has to do with the performers themselves. And so my question uh, really has to do with, well, what about all of those uh, musicians, those performers whose lives were, their, their, their livelihood was, you know, cut short 
Uh, they couldn't perform. They had shows probably, I'm guessing, uh, Mr. Pickett, you're, you're booked out probably a year in advance. Uh, and so what happened to those folks? And more particularly, I don't expect you to answer that, but what I want to know is how the Shuttered Venues grant paid those performers whose uh, performances were canceled because of the pandemic. How, how were they compensated? The, um, Mr. Well, on different, on, on different levels, they've been compensated differently. Uh, there's a national picture and there's, and there's the local and regional picture. Um, we, uh, agencies, uh, booking agencies and management companies were also participants in the Shutters venue, Shuttered Venue Operators Grants. So NEVA, um, and there's a sister organization called uh, NEDO, which are talent agencies, uh, all worked very, very hard toward passing the bill, hoping the bill would get passed. And talent agencies that represent artists and management agencies that represent artists also participated in the Shuttered Venues Grant, were recipients, as long with movie theaters and performing arts centers and, and, uh, and music venues. So that helped support musicians to a certain level. On an individual level, we did things throughout the pandemic. We set up, we weren't, we wouldn't have been able to do this if our landlord was not giving us a certain amount of, you know, a relief in our rent. Uh, we were hosting uh, streaming performances and set up a, um, a, a tip or gratuity function, those streaming performances. We weren't charging anything. Uh, we, um, I think we sold tickets we, we would, we would get a little bit of money back just to pay the expenses, but there was no real income to the Dakota for it. But through the gratuity function on those streaming performances, a number of musicians at the Dakota were able to work and get paid for it. Since uh, these are small things and there are stories like this that uh, go across the entire spectrum of performers or musicians throughout the country. Lots of musicians did shows from home and their individual fans would provide tips. Uh, John of the Brook, who's a wonderful singer songwriter who lives in Minneapolis, had a Monday afternoon show and her fans would, you know, people stepped up to try to protect the livelihoods and the financial stability of musicians who have given them so much pleasure. Thank you. And, and, and then uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Pickett, maybe you also could answer. So those independent musicians though uh, were not did they were not, not, were not eligible for the Shuttered Venues grant in any way. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. Uh, since we've reopened, we have not, Mr. we have been paying musicians uh, at the same level that we would normally pay them, even though our attendance has been down. You know, if we, if we were paying musicians based on our anticipated attendance for all the shows we've done since September, we would not have been able to pay musicians as much. We understand that they weren't the cause of all of this. And uh, our staff is getting paid the normal weight that they would be paid, you know, their uh, salaries are hourly or uh, uh, gratuities from customers. And um, we feel that it's only right to do that musician with musicians. So we've been operating at a significant loss since we reopened. We have not been asking musicians to take that same loss um, because they're the lifeblood of, what, of our business. Thank you. Uh, so it's, that's another economic impact. That, um, thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Pickett. And then I do have a question. Uh, Senator Weber had to leave for another meeting, but I would like to ask this uh, on behalf of him. Um, some of our communities uh, have movie theaters that have also been closed. Uh, this one in particular uh, has had a delay in operating for a year and a half. They haven't had any revenue since 2019. And I, my question is, uh, do they qualify for this Shuttered Venues grant? Yes. Ms. Reed. M Madam Chair and members, yes, the movie theater operators do qualify. They received um, shuttered venue operator grants and they are in support of our tax conformity bill today. All right, thank you very much. Um, members, any, que any other questions? I'm not seeing any hands. Um, I just have uh, Mr. Wilms, uh, I'm wondering if you could answer one question uh, regarding the um, interactivity between uh, PPP and Shuttered Venue and the Shuttered Venue grants? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair and committee members, so uh, as part of the uh, 
new federal legislation that was passed in ARPA, um, the the PPP, you know, the original restriction was that those eligible for PPP would not be able to take shuttered venue grants. This was relaxed. And now the shuttered venue grants, um, the, the amounts received under that would be required to be deducted um, uh, from PPP proceeds. Okay, thank you for that clarification. All right, members, uh, seeing no further comments, uh, Senator Housley, do you have any closing comments? Thank you, Madam Chair and members for hearing this bill. As you can, as you heard from the testifiers, um, how devastating it was to their industry. And these grants uh, definitely helped them out to get through the tough time, but to kick them when they're down to tax them um, is, is something we don't wanna do here. We're the only state still that does it, so to get in with federal conformity on the shuttered venue grants, um, it would it would really help these folks out a lot. So thank you. I uh, thank you, uh, Senator Housley. Uh, the bill will be laid over oh. as amended. Next on our list is um, oh, Senator Bach has his hand up. Senator Bach. Well, Madam Chair, not on this bill because I, I do. This is pretty clear cut. These people were impacted significantly, but just for the members. There is a story in the Washington Post this morning that I was looking at on my phone just now. You know, the federal government pumped about $6 trillion into the economy to try and keep it afloat during the pandemic. There's a Washington Post story today talking about the staggering amount of fraud. Staggering, as watchdog groups are starting to dig into it, and they talk about the fact that it may take years to unravel uh, all of it. So it's Probably not surprising, but the level of it might be very surprising to all of us. Anyway, I think it's worth a read for those of us that, you know, this we do serious business in this room. And, and uh, so anyway, take, take a look at it. Uh, thank you, Senator Bach. Uh, that is, uh, is a staggering amount, and it is, I, I've read that article, and it is a concern, which is why we really do need to ask these questions uh, on many different levels. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, Senator Bach, thank you, Senator Housley. Uh, next on our agenda, we have Senator Coleman, who will be presenting Senate File 2970. She has one testifier with her as well. If you could approach the testifying table, Ms. Kadoon. And uh, just to note, uh, in addition to those technical issues that got us started late, we also uh, were a bit long on our bill, so we're going to try to uh, make sure that we stay on time here and, and allow everyone yet to uh, make all of their comments. So, uh, Senator Coleman, uh, would you like to move Senate File 2970? Uh, yes, and I have a technical amendment, Madam Chair. Yes, and uh, we'll offer the A1, is it the A1? And has it been handed out? It is the A1, I'm not sure if it's been handed out. No, members do not have that yet, it's coming. And uh, we'll have, I believe it's a technical amendment. Let's ask uh, Ms. Pollack if she can give us a brief update on the technical amendment. Looks pretty simple. Ms. Pollack. Madam Chair and members, yes, this is just a technical amendment to uh, ensure that S corporations have the same um, uh, treatment for purposes of the election uh, and their returns as partnerships. Um, and this would apply to the language on 2.21 and 2.22 of the original bill. I uh, thank you, Ms. Pollack. Uh, so the, would you like to offer the A1 as an author's amendment? Yes, I move the A1 amendment. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The amendment is adopted to your bill as amended, Ms. Coleman. Senator Coleman. <laughs> Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I am thrilled to be introducing this bill. Uh, before I came to the State Senate, I was honored to work with the Medical Alley Association and got to see firsthand uh, how critical the research and development tax credit is to the state of Minnesota and for the innovation taking place here in Minnesota. Uh, many of you know that the, uh, the R&D tax credit is such an important tool to keep and encourage good paying research and development jobs here in Minnesota. We were the first state in the nation to enact, enact a state R&D tax credit in 1981. Since then, many other states have surpassed us on the robustness of the credit and have also enacted a much simpler way to calculate the credit. Calculating Minnesota's research tax credit involves a complicated formula and requires a look back to data from over 30 years with the current base year of expenses from 1984 to 1988. 
We have heard from businesses, especially from our small and mid-sized companies, on the difficulties of the calculating and unnecessary compliance costs and burdens. This bill is very similar to past proposals this committee has heard, including our wonderful chair's bill from 2021, as it provides for a simplified calculation for determining R&D tax credits, similar to the federal alternative calculation. This will address the problems with the current calculation that requires going back to books and records from the current base year requirement of 1984 to 1988. Instead, the calculation is current year Minnesota R&D expenditures minus 50% of the average R&D expenses during the past three years to determine the creditable dollars. This bill would have the same rate of current credit calculation, which is 10% for the first 2 million and 4% on qualified expenses over 2 million, which should make it easier and more beneficial for small and mid-sized companies to utilize this method. I sincerely hope this bill will continue to encourage investment in R&D activities and grow Minnesota's innovative economy. And with that, Madam Chair, I have a number of testifiers. Uh, thank you, Senator Coleman. Uh, first on our list, Beth Cadoon, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record, please. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Beth Kandu, and I represent the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, and we're testifying in strong support of Senator Coleman's bill and thank her for bringing it forward. The R&D credit has been an important provision to encourage R&D development and, and to keep those high paying R&D jobs in our state. We know innovation has been an important component of Minnesota's past success, and we know it will be critical for our future success and economic growth. Businesses that innovate, create new products and services tend to be more profitable and stronger than companies that do not. And this bill addresses a problem that's been needing correction for quite a few years now with the current calculation. As, as Senator Coleman mentioned, it's becoming increasingly difficult, costly, and burdensome for companies, especially those small and mid-sized businesses, to be able to calculate it. This makes this tax incentive less effective for those companies. Um, so uh, we have other testifiers that are um, experts in this field, tax practitioners, so I will keep my testimony short so you can hear for those um, testifiers there um, on the virtual. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kadoon. Our first testifier, testifier is Krista Altman, director at Clifton Larson Allen. Ms. Hi. Altman, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. My name is Krista Altman, representing Clifton Larson Allen. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. We are in support of Senator Coleman's bill. This bill will serve an important purpose in encouraging Minnesota taxpayers to increase their research endeavors in the state. As you know, research and development activities are crucial drivers of innovation and economic growth in the US and within Minnesota, creating jobs and keeping us on the forefront of technological advancement. In 1981, Minnesota was the first state to enact an R&D tax credit, the same year the federal credit was enacted. Our credit was and is, and is still patterned after the federal credit rules. Unfortunately, however, we continue to use the same method to calculate the credit that was originally enacted over 40 years ago, which is outdated and difficult to administer. The credit is an incremental benefit, meaning taxpayers are rewarded for increases in qualified research spent. To measure these increases, the credit uses a base amount concept. Under current law, the base amount is expressed as a function of historical gross receipts and historical qualified research expenses. It relies on a concept called fixed base percentage, which can be extremely problematic for taxpayers to establish, as it may require them to look back in time for many years to support historical costs and revenue. In fact, certain taxpayers may be required to look back to the period 1984 to 1988 in order to establish their fixed base percentage. Determining these historical amounts can be challenging, if not impossible, for many taxpayers. Due to the complex fixed base calculations, Many taxpayers end up using the maximum percentage of 16%. This often leads to little or no credit being generated. Additionally, the mechanics of the regular credit base amount often lead to taxpayers being base limited due to high gross receipts, meaning their current qualified expenses do not exceed their base amount and therefore no credit is generated. While the regular credit method is often practical for very early stage companies, at least taxpayers that have been in existence for a number of years with too many technical and practical hurdles to overcome. This should no longer act as a barrier to, for companies investing in R&D in our state. 
recognizing the complexities and practical concerns in establishing a taxpayer's fixed base percentage, the federal government implemented the alternative simplified credit method in 2007. Under the ASC, a taxpayer's base amount is 50% of its average qualified research expenses for the prior three years. We can all agree that this is a much more straightforward method of calculating a base amount. The ASC allows many taxpayers to claim an R&D credit where such a benefit would be impossible using the regular credit method. What's more, many states, including innovation hubs such as New Jersey and Texas, have, a, have adopted ASC type credit rules. Adopting an ASC method is needed for Minnesota to modernize our credit framework, make the credit more accessible to our businesses across the state, and truly carry out the intent of an incentive as valuable as the R&D credit. Thank you again for this opportunity to appear today and voice our support for this important piece of legislation. Uh, thank you, Ms. Altman. And just one question then, uh, the uh, bill before us then is similar to the federal calculation then, if I understand Correct. correctly. Correct, yes, thank that you. is right, ma'am. Yes, and then how many states uh, have, have, or if you know, uh, or you can get back to me, as you noted, most states are moving to this alternative simplified credit um, much like the feds, is that, um, do, you, do you have an idea how many? So, there's about 35 to 45 states that have a state credit. About a third of those have an, an alternative simplified credit method. About a third have their own version of it. And a, a third do you still use that traditional method. We do see a higher adoption and we see more businesses that wanna to move towards those states that have that alternative simplified credit method though. It's just, it's easier and it, it provides a better benefit. Uh, thank you. And that is one of the goals of our committee, uh, beyond, beside uh, empowering Minnesotans, is driving economic growth. And this does appear uh, to fulfill, to help with that mission. All right. Thank you so much. Our next testifier is uh, Michael DePrima from uh, also Clifford, Clifton Larson Allen. Mr. DePrima, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record, please. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, Michael DePrima, tax principal and also um, head of the R&D tax credit practice at Clifton Larson Allen. I'll be very brief. I will really echo what my colleague Krista Altman just said. Um, we are really excited to see more and more states move toward an ASC methodology. The regular credit method, while it might have served a purpose decades ago, it has become frankly antiquated and I think is a deterrent or barrier for companies uh, to claim a credit. Uh, as we know, R&D incentives are a huge motivator when it comes to innovation, economic growth, jobs, et cetera. And um, ASC, while all tax law is um, you know, complicated in its own right, I think the regular credit method is exceedingly complicated and unnecessarily complicated. So I think adopting an ASC type um, system for the R&D credit makes a lot of sense and will make uh, uh, many businesses uh, and taxpayers um, very, very excited to continue to invest in Minnesota and will also provide that benefit that is much more straightforward to calculate. Uh, thank you, Mr. DePrima. Our final testifier, uh, Jessica Young with Medical Alley. Welcome back to the Senate testifying room, Ms. Young. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, um, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jessica Young and I am with the Medical Alley Association. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify this morning in support of Senate File 2970. I wanna thank you, Chair Nelson, for hearing the bill and also thank Senator Coleman for carrying this important legislation. Medical Alley Association is the cross-sector healthcare association in Minnesota that supports and advances Medical Alley's global leadership in health innovation and care. We are proud to represent the entire continuum of care. Our members touch virtually every sector of the healthcare industry, medical device, biotech, payer, provider, digital health, and everything in between. One of Medical Alley Association's core policy pillars is to prioritize our innovative ecosystem. To sustain its leadership position, Minnesota must continue to foster a business-friendly environment for innovators. This requires a continued commitment to supporting entrepreneurs and incubators and ensuring that the state has the resources necessary to capture and retain the growth of organizations that drive our innovation economy. Minnesota's research and development tax credit is one of those critical resources. And Senate File 2970 provides important updates to Minnesota's existing R&D tax credit statute. This 
bill will make Minnesota's R&D tax credit more accessible to companies of all sizes, but especially small and mid-sized companies. This language will save companies time and resources by allowing them to use this simplified alternative calculation. Minnesota has been a leader on research and development, and by making this credit more accessible, it will hopefully encourage more companies to invest in research and development into the future. Medical Alley is home to a vibrant, innovative healthcare ecosystem. Senate File 2970 ensures there are tools available to attract and to retain investment right here in Minnesota. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the time this morning. Uh, thank you, Ms. Young. Members, any comments or questions? Uh, Senator Coleman, we'll turn it over to you to final comments. I would say um, thank you for bringing this bill, first of all. And I, I just want to make note that during the, the last uh, almost two years of pandemic, we have seen, we are living the benefits that come from research and development innovation. We didn't have these monoclonal antibodies when this pandemic first hit, and yet we were able to develop those. One of those uh, developed right here in Minnesota. So it's very important that we continue to be that hub, and I want to thank you for bringing this bill. But let, let's hear your final comments. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to all of my testifiers. Um, Miss Young, that red wall behind you is really making me miss my days at that office. Uh, as our chair mentioned, COVID-19 made a call for innovation and medical excellence, and Minnesota answered that call for the nation and the world. And that is because of the innovation hub we have right here in our backyard. The R&D credit, this bill will help to make that industry thrive even more. And so thank you for your consideration and your support. I thank you, Senator Coleman. The bill is laid over. Our last bill today, members, is Senate File 2558, Senator Rest, Corporate Alternative Minimum Tax and Minimum Fee Repeal. And we'll just keep uh, Ms. Kadoon right up there at the testifying table. Senator Rest, do you have an amendment? Okay, no amendments. Um, and go ahead and move your bill when you're ready. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Madam Chair and colleagues. Um, this bill actually is two bills. Um, it's in two different parts. One is um, repealing the corporate AMT, which was, uh, along with the individual AMT, was first... Um, adopted in Minnesota um, a few years after it was adopted at the federal level, and so it's been with us since 1977. Um, the uh, alternative minimum tax is um, uh, a complement, in a sense, to um, the regular tax that is paid by corporations at um, their um, general rate of 9.88%. And uh, what corporations have to do is after they have followed the general rules um, with regard to their uh, taxable income, um, there are, oh, must be eight or nine uh, different things that they were able to deduct in, in in terms of coming to their ordinary uh, taxable income um, and, uh, and a different rate is applied. Um, those, those things are um, called tax preferences. Um, they're things like uh, the amount of, of uh, depreciation, the type of depreciation, whether it's accelerated or normal or whatever, and I, you know, call your attention to our discussion uh, earlier this week of, of tax expenditures. But it's it's a number of them, and um, they're all disallowed in a sense in uh, determining the the um, corporate alternative maximum um, uh, alternative income. 
taxable income, and then a different rate is applied. That then is compared to the uh, regular tax that has been um, calculated, and if the alternative minimum tax is higher, then the difference is paid um, as part of that, of that tax. But it also uh, establishes a credit, and that credit can be used in, um, in succeeding years against that alternative maximum um, uh, tax. Um, it, can't, it can't be used to, uh, at current law, it can't be used to totally wipe out um, the uh, tax, the tax of, that, that are paid by the, uh, by uh, C Corps, but um, uh, it can, uh, there's a certain percentage that it can be used in any year to uh, reduce that tax. It is a very complicated, um, uh, complicated um, calculation for many uh, corporations. And if you look at the bill um, that describes uh, what 290.0921 um, <clears throat> has uh, set up, um, it, it was changed in the, in the late 80s. Um, and um, I might add that um, the, uh, the author of, of that change um, that still kept the corporate AMT is, um, is sitting right here. Um, but now, um, I think we should get rid of it. And I think we should get rid of it um, because it's a federal conformity item. And um, in, in 2017, the federal government uh, repealed the federal um, AMT um, adjusting uh, uh, the calculation for income itself and what deductions were allowed and so on, and the corporate AMT was seen as an unnecessary complication of the tax system for, for, um, uh, for corporations. Um, in 2019, I had a bill that did the same thing, more or less, that is, uh, repeal the corporate AMT um, and, but at that time, we um, uh, we did not we did not take it up. We did not move um, move forward with it. Um, the uh, we also have an AMT uh, in the um, uh, for individual taxpayers. Repealing that it's sometimes called a millionaire's tax, but repealing that is far more expensive. Than repealing the corporate, um, the corporate AMT, which currently um, for FY23 would be about uh, 41 million, and then after that, um, as those credits are applied against it as well, um, it it takes a couple of years, a few years, for it to be totally uh, wiped out. The second part of this bill. Um, is the uh, minimum tax, and it doesn't apply to corporations. It applies to other kinds of business uh, entities. Um, it applies to partnerships. It applies to S corps, uh, which are similar in some ways to uh, partnerships, except for the issue of uh, general liability of the of the shareholders, um, and. Um, uh, and corporations get hit with it again. The C-Corps get hit with it again. And um, they also need to pay a, um, uh, a minimum fee, but it's, but it's based on a different set of calculations than the corporate AMT. Hmm. Um, it is, uh, since it is paid for by a much broader swath of uh, business entities, it's also far more expensive, as you can see on the um, on the analysis uh, from the Department of Revenue. Um, if we adopted that, 
uh, FY 2023, it would amount to $136 million that this minimum fee is, um, is assessed against. And it's assessed on, again, um, payroll, property, and sales. And um, fortunately, it is adjusted each year for inflation, but it's still a really, um, a really high amount. Now, against the surplus we have, it may seem not so much, but um, it, it, is a, it is a huge hit. So what the bill does is to uh, repeal both of these, and um, one can be done, as you can tell from the uh, revenue estimate and reading through the, if you have any questions, reading through the, the, um, uh, the bill summary prepared by Senate Council, um, it is uh, another very, uh, it, well, I, I guess I regard it as a distortion of income. And, um, and, and particularly, it seems to me, since the feds have uh, repealed the corporate AMT, that it is, uh, it is appropriate for Minnesota to do uh, the same thing. It was appropriate back in 2019, but it is certainly appropriate in, in 2021. Uh, so Madam, Madam Chair, that's the bill if you have any questions. And Ms. Kadoon is here to testify. Thank you, Senator Rust, for the history. Let's try that again. Somebody's mic is wrong. Okay, all right. Thank you, uh, Senator Rust, uh, for the history, uh, the good explanation, and why uh, we're seeking to uh, eliminate these two taxes. Um, and I would say you'd mentioned simplicity, how difficult this is. And one of the things that um, good tax policy does, one of pieces of our mission is simple, simplicity. Uh, so thank you for bringing this. Uh, Ms. Kadoon, do you have any further comments? Yes, Madam. Yes, Madam Chair. And uh, before I call on you, I do see a hand here. Senator Bach. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Rest, this this is the right tax policy, but it's really expensive. Is there some way to scale this or phase it or some other way to do it than how it's drafted? Senator well, Rest. Um, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Bach, um, because uh, there is a rate applied to the um, alternative minimal, minimum taxable income of at cor for corporations, it is 5.8%. Uh, um, for the individuals, it's 6.75%, uh, which obviously, and to you and me and all of us here, suggests that it's scalable. I mean, you could keep this, if you're just trying to reduce the amount of obligation, um, we could just adjust that rate downwards, uh, keep the policy, and adjust the rate. Um, that certainly isn't preferable, um, and um, but keeping in mind that these are two different calculations. Um, in 2019, I just brought forward the AMT and not the minimum tax, but I think we should be looking at them as tax policy together. Um, and as you can see, the minimum tax, because it is spread uh, through other business entities other than C corps, is the more expensive one. Uh, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think we say, well, why don't we just not allow the C corps to pay it, I, uh, the minimum tax. So there, there are certain ways that you could reduce the cost that are unacceptable as far as tax policy is concerned, but the rate um, is not one of them, <laughs> and we might be. Uh, um, we might be looking at that. We could also, um, uh, and because we've seen this with other bills, uh, we could uh, 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 scale back the rate over a period of five years or something till you get to zero, and and at that point it would not, um, uh, it would not 
uh, cost as much. We've done that with um, the sales tax on uh, um, on businesses, uh, on uh, their um, heavy equipment and, and so forth over the years. And that was successful. We got rid of that sales tax over, I think, a period of four or five years. So um, there are ways to make this less expensive in the sense of um, uh, cost to the state. Um, but um, um, I would not prefer to um, do anything other than change the rate, even though it's still a complicated uh, calculation. Well, m Senator Bond. and Senator Ress, you remember in, I think it was 2001, when we did the single sales factor, everybody agreed we should do that, and, I, and it was really, really expensive, much more expensive than this, and there was an agreement we should do that, and I, I think we phased it in over like 14 years or something. It was a really long period of time, and we, I mean, we finally got there and got to the right public policy. <laughs> I just think, Madam Chair, we should think about that. I mean, Senator Ress' bill is the right tax policy thing to do, considering what the feds have done. Just not sure we can do it as quickly as the bill proposes. Yeah, good, good comments, and we all always have to face those realities that um, we do have to phase things in. And I believe, Senator Rest, you were very involved in that 2001 but, but, uh, committee regarding that, that, the sales tax. Yeah, the sales tax on capital equipment that, um, well, that was my bill and, and also the um, single sales factor. But this moving to the single sales factor also then complicated the AMT and, and the minimum tax. So um, it, it was a good tax policy on the one hand, but um, we often have our, our um, uh, reviews from Senate Council that have this line that says interactions, <laughs> and that um, that brings up sometimes there's a shift um, in uh, onto other tax liabilities that we we just need to um, doesn't mean we shouldn't do them. It just means that we should have our eyes wide open on what the implications are, um, and. But you could do, you could do, you could get rid of the AMT, keep the minimum tax, and then start working on the, on the, um, on the minimum tax since it's at this time it's three times more expensive than the than the uh, minimum than the alternative minimum tax. You could also um, uh, the effective date in my bill for both of those is. Uh, um, would be is after tax years beginning after 12 31 uh, 21 you could delay the effective date as well for another year um, that would have an effect on um, on the um, on the cost as well so those are kind of what I see as as the uh, um, as the as the considerations that we should be thinking about um, regarding this particular feature of the tax on business entities in Minnesota. And I particularly look at the AMT because the feds got rid of it in 2017. And, and it, uh, it, it's maybe a slightly different calculation, but um, but we, um, we should be considering it, in my opinion. I thank you, Senator Rest. Ms. Cadoon, did you have comments? Yes, thank you, Madam Ms. Chair. Cadoon. I'm Beth Cadoon with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for hearing this bill today, and thank you again for Senator Rest for her continued work to um, kind of bring forth good tax policy by repealing both the corporate minimum fee and the corporate AMT. We support both provisions. I'll just focus more on my remarks on the AMT because that's the one I frankly hear more concerns about. Just like your car and your house, it's important to focus on maintenance to make sure they are working properly. The same is true of the tax system. And what a better year to do it when you have this surplus. 
We want to make sure that our tax system is working properly without undue compliance costs and burdens and complications. The corporate AMT violates good tax policy rules that a tax be easy to administer, efficient, and transparent. The AMT has none of those attributes. It adds extreme complexity and administrative costs to the tax code for both the taxpayer and the department. The bill does show a revenue cost, but in reality, this is not a tax cut, but for the most part, it's simply a t timing difference. Because taxpayers that pay the AMT receive a credit for the timing item differences, such as depreciation, and this credit can be then used to offset their regular tax in future years, as Senator Russ mentioned. The repeal of the, federal, of the AMT at the federal level has made Minnesota's compliance burden much, even greater. Um, I, I can send it out to the, the committee, but the form, if you looked at the form from 2017, it was two pages long in Minnesota on how to calculate this. It's now 12 because we no longer have the federal um, rules to rely on. Most states have repealed their corporate AMT, and Minnesota is now one of state, six states that still have this. The others are California, Connecticut, Kentucky, New Hampshire, and New York. And I would note this has had bipartisan support, obviously, with Senator Rest in the past, and Governor Walls actually proposed it in his budget recommendation a couple of years ago as, as well. So we urge, urge you to mm -hmm. look at repealing the corporate AMT. I do believe it needs to do, be done immediately, and you could not have phased this one in. But certainly for the minimum fee, that's something that could be done over time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kadoon. Uh, any further comments or questions? Um, Senator Rest, thank you uh, for bringing this bill. Ms. Kadoon, I noticed your comments uh, at the end. That, that was kind of where I was thinking as well, which is try to eliminate the AMT right away, the smaller piece, and maybe phase out the more costly fee portion. So I, I was glad to hear your comments on that. I would have members note uh, that there is a cost savings to the DOR for administering this much-needed um, piece. And uh, you can only imagine, it'll be interesting to know how much those cost savings are to the DOR. And then, of course, think about the individual uh, businesses that are needing to pay this. Uh, and and the, the, um, not just the fees, but the, uh, the uh, cost in calculating them. Uh, thank you so much. Any further comments? Uh, seeing none, uh, this bill, 2958, will be laid over for possible inclusion. Members, we've reached the end of our agenda. Uh, thank you for your patience as we um, continue to become more comfortable with the hybrid hearings and, uh, and the technology that sometimes doesn't always work. Uh, with that, members, um, the meeting is adjourned. Our next uh, meeting will be Tuesday, February, what date is that? February 22nd. Thank you.